Hello and welcome to this episode of Superhero Ethics. Today, myself and Paul Hoppy are talking about issues of multiverses, of canon, of consequences, and that and that some of us might not be quite as excited as others about the multiverse that Marvel is taking us into. All that and more after a commercial break we have no control over. Welcome back. I'm Matthew, your host. As I said, I'm joined by regular co-host, uh, or... Hmm. Now I'm getting a look. Uh, regular guest who is not actually a co-host because he doesn't do any of the work. He just gets the credit for being a co-host quite often. Paul Hoppy. Um, I wish you could see the smile on his face. We'll probably be tr- streaming more of these to his Twitch channel in time. But before we dive into our podcast topic, as many of you who may already be writing uh, rather passionate emails to us uh, can tell, this is this is going to be somewhat of a controversial topic. And I want to be very clear from the beginning to maybe kind of tamp down some of that controversy. The MCU is going into a multiverse style of uh, storytelling that many people, that many of the shows already have gone into, and that clearly we're going to get more of in the future, and that I think quite a lot of, probably most fans, are very excited about. We are in no way critiquing that or attacking that. I think if people are excited about that, that is fantastic. This podcast is, though, about, you know, I do know that some people don't feel quite the same way, and myself and Paul included. And so we want to just kind of talk about that, uh, both because I think, I know I have heard from people who have said like, hey, listen, we'd love to hear someone talk about why they're not excited about this, either because they're curious and want to know more, or because people feel like they they just want to know they're not alone about this. So please take everything we're about to say as my and Paul's own feelings about multiverses and things like this. We're not, you know, going to start an angry campaign to Marvel to get them to stop telling a story like this. We're not going to call for boycotts of films or any nonsense like that. And for those people who love the things we're about to discuss, great. We are. So, I'm so happy for you. I don't even mean that in a condescending way, even though I'm from New York. But sometimes I actually am not condescending, I promise. Uh, Paul's heard it maybe two or three times in 20 years. Uh, the point, though, being we just want to be able to explore the different side of this topic because it does seem like sometimes the, the conversation is mostly kind of coming from the excitement. And excitement's great. Here on the Ethics Podcast, sometimes we try to hold up some other voices. So with all that out of the way, Paul, let me just kind of start by asking, how do you feel about the fact that the MCU is becoming a, a multiverse of stories? In the exact manner in which it's doing it, I no longer have any interest in pretty much anything coming out in the mm-hmm. not-too-distant future. Yeah. It's, I should preface that by saying I had already lost a certain amount of interest in the MCU, Um, It feels to me like a TV show that's gone on for too many seasons. Mm -hmm. And um, Infinity War was kind of like the first thing that kind of pushed me in that direction. There are still things that come out and certainly parts of almost everything that comes out that I do enjoy. Um, But like I have no plans to see Multiverse of Madness, Quantumania, or No Way Home. Like, right. maybe I'll see them at some point when they're on Disney Plus or whatever. But mm-hmm. I'm certainly not going to go out of my way to see them. And the whole multiverse of it all within the MCU, which is already this massive interconnected universe. And I think that's that's where the crux of it is for me. They already right. have this massive interconnected single universe that, to me, already felt like it was bending underneath its own weight. Mm-hmm. When you throw in a multiverse component, uh, it just, for me, it just yeah. feels like too much. And I'm yeah. just like, okay, pass. That's great. And we're definitely going to get into the why uh, you and I have feelings about the multiverse. Many other people do, because they're probably not going to be exactly the same, but I think with a lot of overlap. But I just want to respond first to the kind of first part of what you're saying, because I, I'm in largely the same place. I think I've been more enthusiastic about the MCU than you were. I didn't. I wasn't turned off by Infinity War or Endgame. I thought they were quite good. I, I I didn't love the ending to WandaVision, and I thought Falcon and the Winter Soldier had a lot of real problems caused by the pandemic, but I did think they were quite good. It, it's for me, it was later. It was the Loki show, and now What If, and now all the marketing that's being done around Spider-Man and, and those shows and, and those movies. That puts me in kind of a similar position. Um... I don't think I'm quite as not interested in you are. Like for me, Hawkeye is something I am still quite interested in. I'm mm-hmm. going to be uh, talking about on the MCU. And I promise when I go on the MCU cast, I will not be constantly talking about why I don't like the multiverse. That's that's why this is kind of here, to get these thoughts <laughs> out of my head and onto paper or, you know, recording yeah. as it were. <laughs> Put them in um, the bits. 
And, you know, I have loved the Tom Holland Spider-Man movies, and I loved the dilemma that they set up for Tom Holland at the end of the last Spider-Man movie of, you know, him being outed, him being, like, it, it being told the world that Peter Parker is Spider-Man. And if I hear from folks that that actually is what the movie is focusing on and it's not very multiverse focused, maybe I'll take a look at it. But at this point, I, I'm kind of with you. Like, it, and maybe here's a good way to get into like sort of the concerns. I think for me, one of the first concern is consequences. Mm-hmm. And I know you and I disagree on, disagree on this a lot. You know, I want people to die. You don't. Um, <laughs> in the context of the stories <laughs> I watch. That's a soundbite that could be taken quite out of context. The more you get into a multiverse, the more that things stop having consequences. And it becomes... I think this is kind of what you're saying about the the weight of things. It's hard for me to kind of even understand what's happening in the story, let alone remember, like you said, how do these different characters connect to each other? But, okay, wait a minute. So is it Doctor Strange A who's now talking to Ultron as they're fighting together against T'Challa who's Star-Lord or T'Challa who's Black, Black Panther? Like, Or is it a different version of Doctor Strange? I just... The idea that just seems, like, incomprehensible. Mm. It's funny because I almost feel the exact... I feel the same way for almost the opposite reason. Mm. In that, for me, it's less about things not having consequence. Because it's like, well, there's, like, an infinite amount of every character. Because there's just so many different, you know, verses, basically. And for me, it's more like, I want to see a story. And at the end of the story, I want that to have been the story. I yeah, don't want there too. like to to you know briefly cycle back to Infinity War like Infinity War felt to rag to Ragnarok like as if say Ragnarok was like Schindler's List and you saw Schindler's List and then you saw Titanic but it turned out Titanic was a sequel to Schindler's List and everyone on the boat was like all the Jews that were you know helped to uh-huh. escape by Schindler and I'm like what the like no you've just <laughs> ruined that other movie you know yeah. And so I'm like, wait, so the end of Ragnarok, it's like, yay, they escaped Asgard and didn't all die. And oh, but here's Thanos. Like, no thanks, you know? Yeah. And to me, that's like, and that's sort of why it feels like a TV show that goes on too long. Because not only does it sometimes start to feel not so fresh, I think they've done a really good job, actually, of keeping things fairly fresh. Mm-hmm. Yes, there, I mean, Shang-Chi didn't even have a sky beam. You know, yeah. <laughs> but, like, <laughs> but like certain things visually are very similar, but um, they have really been diversifying kind of the, not just in, in terms of casting and in terms of right. representation, but also in terms of, you know, making one series uh, more of this type of thing, one series more of that type of thing and, and, and making things a little more different and branching out. I think that's great. But every, it's like every story that comes after it influences the stories that came before. And sometimes right. that can be really good, but sometimes it's like, I just want a story to be done, you know? Yeah. And I mean, I think they did a great job of telling stories of like Steve Rogers and, and Tony Stark and, and these like really long character arcs through a number of movies, but, right. and like now they're cert- you know, bringing new characters in and that's cool, but it's like, they keep, also trying to raise the stakes more and it just at some point it it feels like i don't know it just feels like too much um and it's not for me like trying to keep track of stuff it's almost the opposite of like having to now if i go back and watch thor the dark world i have to think about everything that happens after it or whatever right Mm, okay Um, i can see that and then also think about apparently benedict cumberbatch was maybe going to be malekith or something but (laughs) god (laughs) It's a bad idea. Fortunately, chose I mean, Doctor Strange. At least that way he might have had a British accent, because I don't like his American accent much, mm. but he also would have had a British accent speaking dark elvish. So right, right. who knows? Who knows? Um, you know, and I can see that. And it's interesting, yeah, because I'm not... I think I, I, I definitely agree with some of what you're saying. Mm-hmm. And, and for me, that even goes back to before the multiverse. Like, because I think there's ways of doing that well and ways of not. You know, and I, I think this is what you were getting to. I thought phase one of giving each of the heroes their own story 
But clearly having those stories build towards a unified whole in Avengers was great. Yeah, I agree. I thought Phase 2 was had a lot of individually great movies, but overall as a phase, I think of as weaker, mm-hmm. in part because there's some of those movies where it does feel like stuff gets kind of shoved into it in order to set up the next thing. Yeah. Um, and there's things where it's like, why didn't so-and-so call so-and-so? Oh, because this is a solo film. Yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I guess for me, there's the, another part of this is, and this kind of goes to the very nature of why I, I do this podcast, and this is going to get to kind of a larger point that I'll, I'll get to later, but I I watch these movies in part – in. For me, the primary fascination of a superhero movie for me isn't the costumes, isn't the fight scenes, isn't the bringing a story that I loved as a kid to life, because often I haven't read these comic mm-hmm. books. It's that I think issues of who gets to use power and who gets to use power for what they decide is good and how they define good and what happens when people have powers far beyond what we can imagine – I find those questions fascinating. Mm-hmm. And, and here, maybe this is kind of similar consequences, but in a different way. I, I feel like once you get into a, to some extent, a multiverse can be fantastic for asking those kind of questions. Like what the what if universe, sure. if it had been what I thought it was going to be, if it had been more like what it was in the comics, I think was, is an ethical goldmine. And it's one I still want to tap into. But once you start getting all the stories kind of mixed up together, and, it, it, it to me is where it, it kind of the rubber where, where the rubber hits the road on these questions of ethical stuff because it's you know like okay well we, we felt the impact of this happening but then actually it didn't happen you know and this is kind of going to it, mm-hmm. in that way it's it's similar I think to what you're saying about kind of ruining the movies that you saw before right. you know to me the thing about the ending of Loki that made me angriest is it basically seemed to imply that every single character in every single Marvel movie up to Loki had no agency whatsoever because right. everything they yeah. had done had already been decided by these masters of time. Mm-hmm. Um, or in the more multiverse version of it, it's the, well, every decision a person makes, every other decision they could have made is also being made and is also being explored. So right. we don't really get to focus on what are the, what are the results of this one decision they made, you know? Yeah, and, like, the decision that we saw them make in whatever movie isn't, like, a decision that was made because of who they are. It's just which decision they happened to make at that on that timeline that we happened to get to watch. Right, exactly. It, 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 there's no more significance to, like, this was the decision that was made instead of that one. Um, yeah, I totally agree, re-agency. Like, that's, that's yeah. just... It, it's just brutal. It's like, so you've just... Basically undermined all of your characters for all time. Nice job. Right. Yeah. I think the other thing for me is that... Because it's funny, when you're talking about, like, a new movie changing how you look at an old one, I don't always think that's bad. And as an example, I'm right now in the midst of this Marvel Movie Minute uh, podcast where we're taking a very deep look at the movie Thor. And one of the themes in the movie Thor, forgive me for spoilers for something (laughs) ten years ago... Um, is that both Thor and, in his own way, Loki, have this idea of what they think their father Odin wants a king to be in terms of being either a brave and noble warrior or, in Loki's case, like finding a different way to wipe out the Odins, and that they're both wrong because Odin doesn't want that. Odin wants them to be king. He wants whoever's king to be a king of peace, a king of diplomacy, a king who can learn to live with the Odins. That in and of itself is a great move, is a great story. But having watched Thor Ragnarok mm. and now knowing that there was a time when Odin wasn't like that, and that decide, you know, when when Loki says, But father, I thought you would want me to do this, that Loki actually has a lot more justification for wanting that. Like, I don't know if the writers of Thor had that in mind when they wrote the first movie, but either way, it has a big effect on it. Yeah. But I do feel like that at least that's I'm wondering if for you that's too far because no. to me i think that's a that's a self-contained story in a way that the multiverse isn't so all right so how is that different then yeah so first of all i just thought thor ragnarok was great i was super not interested and in, i was like whatever because after yeah. infinity war i was just like whatever and then i saw oh no this was before infinity war i guess i was already like whatever i don't know yeah I, each <laughs> phase i've kind of enjoyed less and less but um the 
it I I wasn't like super into seeing it, and then I went to see. It. I saw the trailer, and I was like, "Oh, that 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 looks good." And I saw the movie, yeah. and I was like, "This is great." And I I do agree that you know a sequel or a threequel or whatever can lend depth to something that happened earlier, right? It yeah. can add perspective that is. I guess what I would say is, in general, it does add perspective, and I can either appreciate that added perspective or not appreciate right. it you know mm-hmm. and in the case of that i i think you know it's almost like now you've got sort of a trilogy where you know avengers also fits in there right because loki was right. pivotal in that but it it kind of completes a whole story and it more than just what loki was thinking in in the first thor movie it adds a lot of depth to odin's character who yeah. you know in the first movie seems kind of generic but if you right. know this backstory it it lends a little bit more to you know depth to the character right sure. all the scenes of him looking clearly like broken hearted mm-hmm. that thor has so fundamentally misunderstood what odin wants him to be a king if now what odin is seeing is thor making the same mistakes that odin did yeah, yeah that's that's such a richer story exactly exactly so i i, I like i'm not saying never make a sequel or right. never you know make a series of on tv or movies or whatever but like you know it there's a point at which something is goes too far for any particular yeah. viewer. And it's not going to be the same point for um, for every viewer, of course, right? right. There's, there's people who love the idea of the multiverse. You know, there's people who are like, oh, a sequel? No, not for me. Never, yeah. right? Like, if they made a se- sequel to The Princess Bride, which apparently they were going to, like, what? <laughs> Why yeah. would you do that, you know? Season two and season three of Heroes, I often think of as great examples. Sure. Of this, where like season one of Heroes is a perfectly complete story. Yeah, and it, it is. Uh, maybe another ex- example that comes to mind as we're talking about this is, well, actually, let me say, say that differently. I think there's another example I think of that kind of actually helps me to maybe better phrase the way I, I think of this. I'm curious if you agree. For me, it's the difference between are you adding to the context of what I saw before mm-hmm. Or are you making what I saw before significantly less relevant than I thought it was? Mm, you know, yeah. and and you know because like the example I was going to use is the the Star Wars sequels movies, which again, lots of people argue about. I'm on. Sure. I I think a lot of people don't like them in general. I think a lot of people love some of them, but not others. People know where I stand on that. Mm-hmm. I don't want to get in that debate. But for me, one of the things I love most about the original movies is that it is about the, not even the redemption of Anakin Skywalker, but the, that in his last moments, Anakin Skywalker does something so fundamental and, and ending his life to not only turn him away from being Darth Vader, but to literally like save the life of his son, save the galaxy, and destroy the Emperor who had he had been in service to all of his life. Mm-hmm. And, and in the prequels, you know, even if they're not my style of movie making, um... They added to that story because they did give us more of Anakin's backstory. And, and oh, the no, prequels, yeah. I was the prequels, the sequels, yeah, sorry, yeah, the prequels. The prequels right. Even if it's not how I would have wanted to tell the story of how Anakin becomes Darth Vader, knowing that story makes what he does at the end of Return of the Jedi that much more significant. That, to me, is like, you know, it, it, not my favorite use of, of adding mm-hmm. context, but at least mm-hmm. halfway decent. But when the Emperor comes back to life in... Uh, Rise of Skywalker, the last of the, of the movies, and <laughs> it, it to me it made Vader's sacrifice irrelevant. You know, right. it made Vader becoming Anakin like okay, you hit pause on things for twenty years, but you didn't or thirty years, but you didn't actually change anything. And and I think to me that's what the multiverse is starting to do is it's just like everything connects, everything. If everything matters, nothing matters. You know. Yeah, I, I hear you. Um, th- yeah, the prequels, you know, I've, I've got my own feelings on them. I very mm-hmm. much respect what they were trying to do. I didn't yeah. feel like they did it very well. Um, I thought the movie poster for the first for the Phantom Menace did it better than the movies. Oh, yeah, the picture the of the pic- Jake Lloyd Anakin with a shadow. Yeah, oh, it's fantastic. That's like, that's like one of the best, maybe the best movie picture <laughs> poster I've ever seen. Um, and that tells the story right there, you know. It's yeah. like... Um, an image is worth a uh, hundred thousand words or something, but, <laughs> um, but yeah, the, you know, those, the prequels are definitely trying to tell the beginning of a story and that's, we've got episodes on that, right. And why that's such a challenging thing to do. The sequels do to me feel very much like they are undermining, um, Anakin's story also sort of 
the like the new republic they're just like yeah let's just like hit reboot and it, it just felt mm-hmm. to me like they wanted to reboot the franchise but they didn't right. really want to reboot the franchise and um you know and so the the prequels don't for some reason the prequels didn't really ruin the original trilogy for me because i found it easier to kind of just mm-hmm. i don't know whatever i mean you can like this will get us eventually into the idea of canon but like yeah i'm a strong advocate of head canon you know yeah me too um but but yeah, the, I I totally agree in terms of like taking away versus adding sort of adding context. I mean, I think Rogue One is maybe the best example of um, mm. a prequel like adding context and making it kind of plugs a hole in in the first right. Star, Star Wars movie, right? And um, but it doesn't like really mess with the characters particularly. Um, except I think Vader makes some weird joke that's like, that does not feel Vader-ish, but whatever. Do not choke on your ambitions. Right, yeah, yeah. It's like, "Mm, no. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, no, I very much get that. And I think, um, to me, Star Wars Rebels, which we're now covering on Mm. the uh, Star Wars Universe podcast, is very similar. And and again, now we're more into the topic of canon than multiverse, Mm -hmm. but I think they're very connected. Because, yeah, they're again, like with um, Rogue One, it's about a moment in time for the overall story, but it's not about those characters, right. you know, like, um, but pulling us back to multiverses for a second. Um, yeah. For you, I know you haven't seen, you, 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 am I right? You've seen all of Loki, but you haven't seen what if, or have you seen? Yeah. I watched the two first two episodes of what if, and then I like read a synopsis about where I was going. I was like, no, like, okay. and when I, when I, I, I kind of enjoyed the first two episodes, but only in the context in my mind of just like, these are just separate stories. Like yeah. I don't, when I saw that they're like, what if it's going to be canon? I was like, thanks for ruining like basically the series that I was most interested in of what was coming forward. Cause I was like, yeah, to me, the idea seems like here's a bunch of stories that aren't of consequence to the rest of the, you know, the universe right. or multiverse. They're just, they're, they're their own thing. And I, I really enjoy there being some stories about the same characters that are a little different versions, you know? Yeah. And yeah, I, it, the question I was going to lead to is yeah. kind of like to talk about what if and Loki in terms sure. of where did the I, I idea of a multiverse spoilers. leave you? Yeah. But oh no, no. I, but I think, I think you kind of jumped us into what if, let's, let's just start there sure. then. Um, Cause yeah, I, for me, I had a very, what if was very much the final nail in the coffin for me mm-hmm. of, I don't want to watch this. Um, and it was those episodes toward the end where – because I, I thought the idea of, like, what if it was Carter who became – you know, what if it was Agent Carter who becomes Captain Carter who, right. be, who becomes the super soldier instead of yeah. Steve? Or, you know, even stuff like what if there's a zombie invasion of the MCU? Like, mm-hmm. that's – or what if Hank Pym is actually pulling every string whatsoever always? Raise some eyebrows about that, but sure. Um, to me, yeah, I mean, that's the heart and soul of ethics is that, you know, it's asking, like – what if this different thing had happened? Right. What would that have been better or worse or different or how would it have changed? And, and what are the things that would stay the same no matter what you change versus what wouldn't be? But you're right. Like I – and I talked with you know our friends Will and Steve from the uh, Hype is My Superpower podcast. And they talked, they talked to us a lot. We actually did an episode with them. Yeah. I'm like, what is the nature of what if in the comics? And, and I was really excited about the idea that these were standalone stories that mm-hmm. were – it was fun to explore, but they weren't trying to change everything. You right. know? Whereas like now when I try to think about like, okay, what do I know about this person as a character? I've got to be trying, wait, but do I think about this version or that version mm-hmm. or, you know, it just. And like, yeah, if I, you want to spin one of those off into a series, if you want a Captain Carter series, like be my guest. Cool. You know, sure. I'll watch a series. That's the, I mean, I like maybe do agent Carter. But but like yeah, Captain Carter, maybe finish cool Agent Carter, right? Exactly, exactly. Maybe tell the rest of that story. But it, it it just like making every character kind of take every decision or whatever mm-hmm. is like. Mm, now, who are they though? Like, who right. are they actually? Right. Especially because what they wound up doing was leaving a lot of the what I thought were the most interesting questions on the table. Mm-hmm. You know, like to me, vision who where Wanda has become a zombie and Vision is now like basically his love for Wanda is enough that he will sacrifice everything else he believes in, including mm-hmm. leading his friends to their possible doom to to let them be eaten and devoured by Wanda. Like that's an ethical story. Like right, let's right, explore right. that more. Um 
But instead, I just wound up feeling more just like, okay, we're just setting up this thing. We're, all mm. of this is being done not to actually explore the what if, but to set up where we want to have at the right. end that we can now have this other Doctor Strange floating around in time who's almost definitely going to be part of Multiverse of Madness mm. and Agent of Carter and right. like all this kind of stuff. Yeah, it also to me, like, that doesn't sound like Vision to me. Mm -hmm. You know, that doesn't sound like the the one who, like, picks up Th Thor's hammer like it's nothing in Ultron. Right. You know, like, I'm like, who's that? Like, I guess that's just a different, that's a different vision? Like, right. you know, that doesn't, uh, I don't know. It, like, one thing that, the thing that actually bothers me the most about, and this is true of multiverses in general, for the most mm -hmm. part, it's also, but it's so far completely super true of, you know, the MCM, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> um, is, like... They're so, like, anthropocentric. You know, they're so centered on humans. And, like, mm -hmm. the idea that, what, there's a Doctor Strange in every universe? Like, what about all the universes where, like, there are no humans? Right. Because, like, you know, just there were no humans. It just didn't happen. Like, right. wh why, like, why is everything so run by humans and these small number of other, you know, beings? Like... Why is there like a Steve Rogers in every universe? Like it doesn't it doesn't make sense, you know? It's yeah. like the the different verses should be so much more different from one another and the sheer number of possibilities is just like mind-breaking, you know? Like right. human existence in the history of time is such a minuscule insignificant thing yeah. that when you try and do something on such a grand scale like a multiverse, it's like, mm, yeah, but like Yeah, but there's been a lot of scientific research that talks about how, and this research is not meant to be religious in any way. People take it as the justification for intelligent design, and I'm not mm. okay. arguing for that at all. But there's been a lot of scientific research that says, like, here are these many multi, here are these many moments in like the development of geological history, where if something had been just like a teeny bit off, mm -hmm. you know human life, let alone life itself, would have probably not evolved right. as it as it has or at all. You yeah. know, if, like, this meteor had hit just a, a few meters over in a different place, sort of life hadn't generated in quite this way. And, and you can – if what if is – if the multiverse is every possibility, then you've got to go all the way from, you know, what if the Earth never formed to what if someone hit the button during the Cuban Missile Crisis right. and humanity got wiped out? You yeah. know, because there again, we probably don't have Doctor Strange if we don't have hospitals. Or right, exactly. People. Um, you know, and, and there's a comment that was made by someone defending the multiverse. And I'm not going to, it doesn't matter who it was, because again, I'm not attacking this person, but I think this was the thing that really clarified for me where, where I am lost on these mm -hmm. is. Because they were responding to someone kind of making – they were trying to – they were responding to someone who's trying to figure out how, the, how all the pieces fit. Right. And they basically said, look, we're in a multiverse. That means don't think too hard. Just enjoy it. And that's when I was like, oh, I get it. Yeah. Because, I, I, you know, sometimes there's a thing where, like, you really love it and no one else does mm -hmm. or everyone else loves it and you don't. And you're kind of like, what's wh – yeah, yeah. Where's the disconnect? I'm familiar. And the, and I, I was I like, started to watch Game of Thrones and then stopped and then. Yeah, fair. <laughs> um, like, I don't understand how you wouldn't love Squid Game, but I respect that you do, you know. Mm. Um, and. Uh, and, yeah, I think to me that was there's like, oh, no, because for me, the thing that really got me back into superheroes was Batman Begins mm. because it was about thinking seriously yeah. and thinking hard about these things and that, you know, the first couple of Iron Man movies and, and even Hulk and, and you know, some of those yeah, until we get to Dr. Strange, until we get to Thor. But the original conceit was this is a universe based in science mm -hmm. and things are going to happen that have a scientific explanation. Yeah. The scientific explanation is kind of even, hand wavy. Even Thor, right? Yeah. Like. They're... The Asgardians are supposed to have their own science, even if it's like not the same as ours. Right. They're basically just like, you know, the idea that any sufficiently advanced technology will appear like magic to... Right. You know, the idea is that they have the technology and it just looks like magic because... Yeah. You know. So so I have a kind of theory that I want to develop on that, but first let me just talk about the, the other big thing that the MCU has been doing that I think is where a lot of people fell in love with the multiverse even more and a lot of people maybe fell off the train. What's your take on how the topic is explored in Loki? 
Because I feel like Loki especially, I mean, Loki is literally where we get the justification for the multiverse that we think we're going into. Yeah. Um, what What's your take on kind of how that was handled there? Yeah, kind of just the worst. Yeah. Like, Loki was, it was borderline unwatchable for me. Um, but, like, the acting and the dialogue was so good that yeah. I would enjoy scene to scene. And then they would start explaining, like, what's going on. And I'm like, that doesn't actually really make any sense but you're talking like it's supposed to and that's kind of where my problem is right there's yeah i think the movie's looper or something it's like Mm -hmm. it involves time travel and somebody start they're like ah don't we're not like don't even worry about it and they're clearly just being like look we're not going to try and explain some theory of time travel it's just a thing in this movie just just go with it and you know time travel is kind of the thing before multiverses and here it led to a multiverse right but like right yeah, I, th- I think the two is very interlinked. Yeah, and time travel to me often works in comedies. Like, why does yes. Back to the Future work? Because it's a comedy. Yeah. You know, why does Austin Powers work? Because it's a comedy. It's specifically not asking, it's it's not only not asking you to think hard about it, it's telling you, we are not here to try and tell you a logically cohesive story. Yeah. We're here to tell you a fun story. Exactly. And like, I think even like Terminator works the same way, where it's like, you know, this is the premise it actually makes no sense if you think about it hard. Right. Like somebody can't send their father back in time to become their father. Spoilers for Terminator, I guess. But like, you know, it's just a horror movie, right? It's an action horror right. movie. And then the next one's just an action action movie, basically. But like, it, it's like they're not trying too hard. I think as they went on with their franchise, it gets a little bit more like, yeah. you know. But like here, it felt like like they've got this whole, you know... Um, agency, right, that's basically devoted to paring down, you know, cutting off branches of the timeline to prevent a multiverse from existing. But, like, that that just fundamentally doesn't make any sense. Yeah. And yet they're trying to, they're playing it off with a straight face like it does. And that's the problem to me, is they're trying, they've got this, like, shaky foundation that they're, like, they're not just like, oh, just go with it. They're, like, really trying to explain it like it's something important. It's, like, right. what the plot is based upon. And, in fact, like, kind of the whole phase of plots, right? Like, this is some long-term project that there's going to be a lot of more pieces that go on top of it. And it's not on a solid foundation. And right. if they were just kind of winking at us about it or just, like, eh, just let's just go with it, you know? Like, mm-hmm. that would be one thing. And, like, maybe I'd be like, all right, I guess that's just what we're doing. But people, you know, fans being like, oh, just go with it. It's like, that's cool. You do you. But that's definitely not how they're selling it. That's not right. how they're setting it up. They're setting it up like it is this very important thing. That's what the whole struggle is going to be about. And for me, that just, it, it like, it kind of ruins itself in that regard. Yeah. No, I, I think it's perfectly said. Like, to me, you know, it... it Part of the point of a MacGuffin off in a movie is that it's like, it's the thing that the plot revolves around, but the actual details of it aren't supposed to matter that much. Exactly. You know? In Pulp Fiction, what is in the briefcase that glows, no one knows. Right. But clearly it's a very valuable briefcase mm-hmm. that everyone wants. Yes. And to me, but it's once you start saying, okay, no, no, it's not just that here's the gimmick. It's that the gimmick only works now and now, but not this other time. Okay, now you now you are asking me as the audience to try and understand the logic of how this works. Mm-hmm. And then you have to keep to it. And I just the multiverse itself just becomes completely illogical. Yeah. You know, and com- I and, agree. and and here's where here's the kind of theory that I've been building towards, and I'm wondering if you feel the same, is that and this is also part of why I want to be careful not to be like, oh my god, the MCU is ruining itself, or like this is terrible. It's just that maybe this is where I get off the train. I'm starting to wonder if this is the point where my dislike of comic books and comic book logic is mm. what's holding me back. Maybe. Because, you know, multiverses and the idea that death has no consequence whatsoever and that there are 12 different versions of characters, none of whom are the same, is all things that are pretty accepted in comic book storytelling now, especially in DC and in Marvel. Yeah. Uh, I did an episode recently on uh, Doctor Doom as a villain, and I tried to kind of like learn a lot about him by by doing Wikipedia searches and stuff. And it was like, oh yeah, so here's all these things this Doctor Doom did. Right. But then this version of Doctor Doom did all these different things, and yeah, I was yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I have no idea who this character is. Right. Right. And 
especially because I know that it is the people who love comic books more and more, not across the board. I think you can be, I, I think you can totally be someone who doesn't love comic books or just introduced to them who still loves this kind of storytelling. And it's so great for you. But I, I think for me, that's maybe where I'm really struggling is the MCU movies pulled me in because they said, look, even if you didn't really like comic books, if you thought they were kind of silly because death had no consequence and everything could always happen, don't worry, we're not going to do that here. We're mm. going to tell you a cohesive, singular, linear story where things matter and things affect each other and death maybe sort of matters, but kind of. Um, and, and this feels to me the most where they're like, we're not doing that anymore. At which point I'm like, okay, well, if you're not, then... Peace. Mm. I enjoyed it, and some parts of it I'll still really love, but I might just give Multiverse of Madness and Spider-Man a skip. Right. Yeah, um, I mean, to me, I, I kind of don't mind it as much in comics, but, I mean, I don't read a ton of comics. I've kind of inter intermittently read them. Usually, like, when the library, I'm near a library where I can just go pick up, a, you know, a stack of comics or, like, graphic mm -hmm. novels or whatever. I, You know, I, I've never, like, followed a title from, you know, episode one until, you know, 254, or however long they go, you know, right. I've like just read kind of books here and there. And I kind of enjoy that. Just like, here's a story, you know, and sometimes a story isn't even really much of a story. It's kind of like, all right, we're starting at like D and we're ending on F, you know, yeah. it's like, but it's the, you know, the experience of it being with the characters, um, you know, looking at the pictures and, um, I, I do feel like Loki was the most comic book co of comic book series or movies that I've ever mm -hmm. seen, you know, in terms of like where it was going with all that. Uh, the, the thing is like, I feel like comic books don't ask us to take them too seriously. Like you can, or you can yeah. not, but it's like, it's not like aiming for this kind of high drama, whatever. And right. so one of the reasons Loki felt so off to me was that it came right after Falcon and the Winter Soldier, which came yeah. right after WandaVision, you know, which even right after Endgame, like Endgame was like sort of a fun time heist, but it, it also had a lot of weight to it, I felt, yeah. you know, and you and, kind and of, were, like, in terms lots of, of us were, lots of us were talking about like uh, WandaVision and Falcon and the Winter Soldier, it was like, yeah, these are Emmy worthy, like acting performances and writing performances and things like that. And, and. Yeah, it, it's, I hadn't even thought of that, but you're right. Loki came right after kind of the least comic booky mm -hmm. um, yeah. kind of storytelling. And I mean, there were there were parts of Falcon and the Winter Soldier that felt very comic bookish, and the, and the fact you know them kind of shoehorning Sharon Carter and Baron Zemo in in the ways they did to me actually took away from the story. Um, I, I would have done with a lot more of just you know what the main story kind of and like Yori, like well, let's wrap that up. Um, I, I sent that clip of the Born Ultimatum where Born anyway, never mind. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but like I, I do feel like, you know, there there was a lot of weight to those, you know, and, and even if it was sometimes uneven and, and I didn't love everything in those series, I really felt like they were going for some like dramatic heft. Right. right. And Loki felt like it was also going for this dramatic heft, but multiverse. You know, yeah. and so it had this one element that felt like it was pulling away from that in like the opposite direction. And so I'm like, look, if you don't want me to take your thing that seriously, don't do something that serious and you can have all the wonky whatever you want. And it'll just be like, OK, right. well, this is just silly. And either I like it or I don't. But here I feel like they're kind of trying to have it both ways and trying to act like their multiverse idea is like this really serious concept. And yeah. like... It, it, it's, it's to just me not. it's not <laughs> yeah and i do also again want to um some of you may have already hit send on your tweets and that's fine but to mm. hold off some of those who are still at their keyboard i don't think either one of us is saying that there are that you cannot have a comic book that has seriousness and heft and oh weight. of course of course clearly there's tons of them i think but yeah. it's more like the general like concept of comic book logic mm -hmm. is kind of what we're getting at here you know yeah and i i feel like comic <sighs> From ones that I've read tend to either be more squarely in the, you know, kind of trying to be a little more serious. And I think a lot of times it's kind of more street level stuff, you know, yeah. compared to um, the, you know, when you're going off of yeah. Earth. First, that's the first step. Then you're going like forward and backwards in time. That's the second step. And then you're going to like multi multiple realities or universes or whatever. 
that's like the last step. And I, I mean, I think it's kind of funny. I've not read many comic books by any means, but I've read some. And probably two of my all-time favorites are, for all intents and purposes, what if stories. Mm. Because one of them is about, you know, one the you know Red Sun is about oh, yeah. what if yeah. Superman, I and mean, that's a literal what if story. What if yes, Superman landed in the Ukraine instead of Kansas? Yeah. And I, I think you really put your finger on what it was that uh, really kind of, because I think for me it was that like Loki made me be like, ugh, I, I don't want this. I don't think I want this. And then what if was the, okay, no, they really are going there, mm-hmm. you know? And it was just that kind of one-two punch of, the, you know, and again, it, it's not that it's bad. It's just that this is. It's just not the storytelling for me. Yeah, and like I'm, I'm happy that um, there are people who are enjoying it. I mean, kind yeah. of. Like, I'm happy for the people who are enjoying it that they are enjoying it. If nobody was enjoying it, then they would just do something else. So yeah, maybe I'd like that better. <laughs> oh, so you know, true. it's like the more people who like, you know, the Snyder cut, the worse that spells for the DCEU going forward. Or DC yeah. films going forward, like from my point of view, you know. Although it seems like Snyder and WB kind of already broke up or whatever. I don't know. Whatever. Um, yeah. We can circle <laughs> around to DC in a minute. But like, um, I don't know. I say send those tweets, you know. Like, yeah, okay. yay, controversy. <laughs> you know, trick or tweet. Oh, definitely send know. us the tweets. I just mean that Yeah. I, I don't want the tweet that says, oh, have you never heard of a serious comic book? Like clearly right. there's, there's of course, lots of them. Of course. I mean, there's, there's, uh, there's a... Like, maybe my favorite comic that I've ever read was, this isn't an alternate universe so much. It's Magneto's backstory mm, before yeah. he gets his powers. Yeah. Like, and it's, it's I think it's called Testament or something. Um, I could be wrong. But it's it's really good. And it's, like, that's that's serious. Yeah. For me, one of my other favorites is Alias, which is, I, I think, the original Jessica, Jessica Jones, Jones line. Yeah. She might have appeared in other things. But yeah, I mean, so much of it's about her dealing with PTSD Mm -hmm. and her dealing with the results of her time with Purple Man and her dealing with other people. Like it's her, a lot of it's set kind of in the midst of the Sokovia Accords and she's dealing with like what happens when when a parents think that their kid might be a superhero. Right. Or when a girl starts faking being a superhero because she's getting bullied at school, you know, Mm -hmm. I mean, whatever it is. Um, Yeah. But again, like that's a person dealing with their reality with somewhat outsized human-like powers. Right. You know, that's not, you know, time travel. That's not multiverse. Yeah. It's not even off-planet. I mean, and even I think, because I think I'd be, a, like, uh, there's actually an example of a multiverse that I think I am pretty happy with. And it's, okay. it's a lot less serious, but it, it doesn't go there. But I first just want to use an example of mm-hmm. a, this is not multiverse as much as time travel, but to me, Doctor Who is, like, a perfect mm, way of dealing okay. with that stuff. Because... Doctor Who is often quite silly and fun. Mm -hmm. Doctor Who deals with incredibly complex, heartfelt, like that show has made me cry numerous times. But the time, they're very clear, like the time travel is a plot device in order to set up the kind of stories they want to tell. Right. It's not like the fundamental part. And there's only a couple of episodes where the, the logistics of time travel is a point in the story. For the most part, I mean, he literally says, time is wibbly wobbly stuff. Like, don't try to understand it, you <laughs> right, know? Right, right, And th- I think that's one of the most brilliant, like, writing things I've ever seen, mm-hmm. where it's like, we're going to take all of your logical concerns about time travel and throw them out the window and just say, let's just tell the stories that you can around time travel. Right. Um, and do, so, the, but do, like, episodes have a big impact on future episodes, or is it very episodic? Or it's it it's very... fairly it, – to me, it's kind of in the burn notice field of, like, okay. it is episodic. Um, they establish this idea that, like, there are fixed moments in time mm-hmm. and that, like, the the fundamental course of history cannot be changed, which right. gets into a lot of, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Ah. But again, there's – but, yeah, it's mostly – it's, like, like, the things can affect things for the time traveler, but, like, it – yeah, I think some of the stories where they do have that that kind of like multiversey, like let's go back and fix the past to make the present better, right. is is where a lot of things go off the rails for the show, mm, to okay. be honest. Um, but what I can say is, to me, uh, an example of a multiverse that I think works, in part because it is not multiversal storytelling; it's telling a series of individual stories in a multiverse, is the Arrow universe. Oh, okay. We're like. Because, you know, I think one of the things that you start to have happen on superhero shows and movies is if all these characters exist, why are they not affecting each other? You know, why is it the things that are happening in this universe aren't – in this city right. aren't affecting what's happening in another city? Yeah, yeah. 
And Arrow did. I mean, first of all, Arrow does not take itself as seriously as the MCU. Sure. Uh, sometimes it does oh, to its de- yeah. Sometimes it does to its detriment. It's, it's um, more. It's more grimdark. But yeah. <laughs> But I think a lot of what Arrow does is to say, okay, so Flash and Arrow exist in the same world, and that mm-hmm. makes sense. Yeah. But Supergirl exists in a different universe. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's the Legends Superman of Tomorrow is, exists right. in a different universe. And right. that, or sort of. Sort of. Um, <laughs> and, and that, like, there are specific moments where they come together, but the story isn't all this. In the story, the different universes are fundamentally separated from each right. other. Is that what? What's your take on like how DC uh, on TV approached that that multiverse? Um, I think I only watched up to the first like crossover, first or okay. second crossover. So I, I didn't see uh, the later ones, so I, I can't speak to that. But I I did feel like it made sense to be like, yeah, we're making all these shows; they don't necessarily all exist in the same universe, and we can have them cross over a little here and there. But we're not going to have some big thing where the fate of multiple universes is what's going to um you know be be in the balance basically right um and that part worked for me i mean i have a couple other examples of multiversal storytelling that i I, are some of my favorite stories yeah um i I think that's good we're not talking about that all multiverses are bad we're saying when the story is set in a multiverse where the walls between all the universes are coming down mm-hmm. and thus everything is blending, that's where we th- – is that fair to say like, that that's where the, we get into storytelling trouble? I mean for me it's it's just – it's a device that you have to be careful with and I think it's easy to kind of get lost in it. Yeah. And for me like I saw Zack Snyder say something about wanting all DC things to exist in one single multiverse – and that then, like, the other, all the stories would feel more important somehow. And I was like, no, no. <laughs> like, um, I, wait, have you seen the Flash trailer? You haven't, right? I haven't, but I've had some of it spoiled to me. So I, okay. I know that, um, well, there was you a big reveal that was told. Show up? Uh, Michael Keaton is Batman. Right. Which, an old like, Batman. to me, if, if the principal conceit is that, all DC movies in all time are all connected and it's all one multiverse. And this is a really important idea. I hate that. Yeah. I'm not here for that. But if it means that I just get to see Michael Keaton as old <laughs> Batman, like I'm totally here for that, you yeah. know? And I saw the trailer and I was like, Hmm, I, this, hmm. I, I didn't expect to have any interest. Like I wasn't even real. I haven't even really wanted to watch more DC movies because Two movies ago was like I think the most bad movie I've ever seen, and <laughs> just, that was just the, the thing you mean. Yes, the yes the the four hour <laughs> slow motion extravaganza, um, <laughs> and by most bad I don't mean per minute I mean total amount of badness because when you have four hours you just got a lot of room for bad. That's true. That's but true. like, then the Suicide Squad came out. And I was like, well. It's got Idris Elba. I guess I'll watch yeah. it. And, you know, I was like, okay, this is this is a pretty good movie, you know? And, like, I saw this Flash trailer. I'm like, hmm. I saw the, the new Batman. And I'm like, I'm like, really? Edward as Batman? Hmm. But, like, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> it looks good. Like, if all of that stuff is necessarily connected in some really important way, mm-hmm. I, I just, I don't care. I don't yeah. want to know that. But, like, the thing that DC has done that I think largely has been seen as to its detriment is the sort of lack of connection between its movies right that actually helps me now because now i can see a decent movie and not care about how it's connected to the other movies because a bunch of the movies that they made i do not particularly like yeah and some of them were good and i think that's a really good point i think it again goes to like the seriousness with which you're taking the multiverse you know if if the flash movie is fundamentally about why it is that all these Batmans are the same and mm-hmm. Flash having to figure that out, like mm-hmm. that's going to be a lot less interesting to me. Yeah. But if it's just, yeah, hey, there's Michael Keaton and Batman and like we're going to give you a hand wavy explanation for it, but just have fun with it. Again, like I, I am, I'm willing to just have fun when the movie yeah. kind of wants me to just have fun, yeah. but gives me enough of a logical grasp on it. Um, Cause I was going to say, I think, I think pers- this may well be one you were going to use as well. My personal favorite example of a multiverse I think that works is the Spider-Verse and the, the Miles Morales into the Spider-Verse movie. Yeah, where, it's one of three for me. Yeah. yeah, where I think that they do a really good job of establishing, yes, there are all these different Spider-People all over the place, but 
not in every universe, and some of them are very similar to him. Some of them are completely different species or different right. color palettes yeah, or yeah, different, yeah, yeah. you know, like yeah. di- two dimensional instead of three dimensional. Yeah. Like, and and you're not meant to figure out the logic of it. You're not meant to, because in the end, it still is. It isn't the focus of the story. The focus of the story is Miles Morales's growth and these people coming together for this one moment and then all going back into their own universes. You know. Yeah. Yeah, and like the the principle like the story is built from the multiverse idea because Kingpin's trying to do what Kingpin's trying to do, right? Right. And that's what triggers the story and then all these spider folks show up. But like it doesn't you don't have to go beyond that. It's like, yeah, he's trying to mess with the multiverse. That's a bad idea. Like, let's send you all home and fix things. And it's, right. it's all kind of tied off, you know? Yeah. And it's it's also just, like, it's a great story. Yeah. But the thing it, is, it's, like, it's one animated movie. And I think it's easier to successfully do one animated movie with a multiverse than when you're trying to tie together, you know, yeah. literally dozens of, of different stories. Right. Because especially, I think, I think this is kind of what you're saying. Or I'm making sure that we're in agreement here. What that is about, what both the the Arrowverse and the Spider-Verse do is say, there is a multiverse, Mm -hmm. but none of us can perceive it. And then this one specific moment is going to cause like a pinprick to connect all of them. And then at the end of the story, the pinprick will close. Whereas what's happening in the MCU is that not we are now getting the logic of the multiverse explained to us, which never happens in any of the other. Mm-hmm. And we're being told that actually now the multiverse is just the universe because all the walls have come down between them. And that's where, you know, I kind of get lost. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I didn't follow through to the end of what if, but that, that sounds yeah. like a nightmare. Um. <laughs> so, so what are your other two uh, uh, good examples of multiverse? Well, versus one is um, Justice League Crisis on Two Earths. Mm. Which is, there's another whole thing, Crisis on Infinite Earths, and that's a super multiversal whatever. But, like, this is an animated movie, right. and, you know, the multiverse is relevant, but it's more, you know, as the name implies, Crisis on Two Earths. It's like, there's some characters from one Earth, they go to the other Earth, and then they go back to that Earth. And it's like, they talk about other Earths, and that might be sort of involved and whatever, but it's like, it's pretty straightforward. And it's just yeah. a good story that happens to have this multiverse you know, component to it. Right. But, and while that is essential to the plot, it's not really like that big a deal. Yeah. You know, and the, the other one that I thought that, that I love, um, but again, this is a large series and there's just a little bit of element of sort of multiverse, whatever is the justice league animated series. Oh yeah, that's true. Where they have the whole justice Lords thing, which is like, Oh, well that's a, that is not the way we want to see these characters, but we're not, we don't sit with, you know, the main characters in those versions for a long time. Right. Right. They, they show up for like a two episode arc, but then that's referenced later when they're talking about sort of the way things might go. And like people's knowledge of that as another reality influences their actions in present day, you know, in not in present day, but in like, the, the main timeline that we're following most of the time, right. right? And then there's another thing where they go to a parallel dimension and they come back. And it's like, it's not a big deal. They're like, they're mostly like self-contained kind of stories. They don't have huge implications, but they have just a little bit of like, yeah, if you knew that there was a Superman who killed Lex Luthor, who killed President Lex Luthor in the Oval Office with like his heat vision... Um, you might wonder why he didn't just like sever his hand or something, but whatever. Um, but like that might influence how you viewed present day Superman, you know? Yeah. And they did build a pretty large connected universe, right? Batman, the animated series, Batman and Robin adventures of whatever, um, Batman beyond the Superman animated series. And those things influenced the justice league series, but like there wasn't a lot of multiverse. It was like, there's just like a little, you, yeah. you know, if you get a little story here and there, basically to me, it's like the multiverse is such a vast idea that if you want to engage with it, almost like you can almost only tell a small story yeah. or your whole thing. Like the problem to me with the what I don't like about the Marvel multiverse is that 
everything there was already this huge interconnected universe and like then they're stacking on top of that a giant multiverse yeah you know yeah, it, it, I, I think you're right it, it is just too much because it's the the more i think about it the more i'm realizing like multiversal stories where it's small and contained and where i don't have to think about the metaphysics mm-hmm. that, that's the I don't want to have to think about the metaphysics of a multiverse because right. if I don't think you can tell a story to me that's going to make sense about them. Mm. Similarly, like, like Doctor Who, you don't have to think about the metaphysics of time travel. Um, you know, cause actually, as you were saying it, I was thinking about like not quite a multiverse, but in terms of like a what if story, which is kind of a multiverse, like every play on the uh, Christmas Carol by Charles Dick, you know, Christmas sure. Carol by Charles yeah. Dickens is someone showing you know, Ebenezer Scrooge, if you keep making choices like this, this will happen. Right. Is that a dream? Is that an alternate reality that's being taken to? Well, that's a, a storytelling trope that's now been used for 120 years. And yeah. often it's a dream, but sometimes it is. Like like you said, it's like, well, what if there is a universe where the Justice League don't make the choices they do, and it's a pretty terrible one? Mm-hmm. Star Trek has the mirror universe, which is mm. kind of all about that. And, and it's a pretty dark thing. And it... In both of those cases, it's supposed to be something that literally exists. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it, it it's storytelling to tell a point, to make a specific point and, and have a specific story instead of saying, let's blow open the doors and tell our stories in the multiverse and make right. the multiverse it's, and make rebuilding the walls of the multiverse or tearing them down a fundamental story element. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Um, it, yeah, it just... I feel like it's just asking too much. Yeah. Kind of, of, of me as a viewer. And like, <laughs> I, I don't mind things being complicated. I enjoy things yeah. being complicated, but it, it kind of just, I mean, I think the Loki point is, is a bigger issue to me of just like the question of agency. Yeah. But, but yeah, it's like now that you're in phase four, now you want to go and like basically rewrite, the laws of physics essentially, or, you know, yeah. it, it just, I don't know. I, I, I feel like there's not that much like to grab onto. Yeah. And, and, and part of the thing is why Loki frustrated me so much is at first I thought Loki was going to do the exact opposite because mm. one of the things that always bothers me about the idea of the correct, and this is more about time travel, but it's obviously very connected. One of the things that has always bothered me is the idea that there is a correct timeline or that there are right. fixed moments in sp- in time or that there is like a way – because to me, if you tell me that there's a decision that's been made, my first question is always who's the decider? Yeah. Who decided that? And again, it gets into agency. It gets into theology in some ways. And so if Loki, if Loki what was saying was the whole idea of a fixed timeline, of the correct timeline – is itself ridiculous and arbitrary and created by arbitrary fallible beings. I was like, cool. This is one of the best attacks on time travel stories I've ever seen. Mm. But when it then became actually, but yes, they are fallible. Yes, it's arbitrary, but also it's very important. And it's, it's the very structure of reality. And without that, it it just like, I was like, I don't know what point you're making anymore. I don't know what you're doing and you've lost me. Yeah. And I feel like they kind of kicked the ball down just the road to season two. Yeah. You know, in, in just sort of like, you know, Oh, where did he fall into the sequel, you know, into the season two, <laughs> like where it's just like, it, it, yeah. I, I feel like you aren't exactly left with answers. They're just like, let's give you as many questions as possible and kind of give you answers, but then tell you that those aren't really the answers. And then here's this other thing. Look, shiny ball. Like, right. It, it, <laughs> exactly. I don't know. I, I, it just I'm I'm left at the end of it feeling just kind of empty and like yeah and just like a sort of like okay I I don't care anymore and you know I'm happy some people do for them you know yeah. and you know you do you but like for me my defining moment of I don't get what other people like about this with Loki was spoilers for a show that's now like six yeah. months old or whatever time is a weird concept um <laughs> and i'm bad at it uh, uh, it's uh like four, matt, yeah. matt math is also weird matt matt math being a thing um but the point is the moment was when i was doing a live watch of the newest episode with friends and it's the episode where we think that um owen wilson's character has been killed or pruned 
And then at the very end, like in kind of the, uh, in the very end, uh, it looks like Loki's been pruned. But then, of course, the after credits, like, show that he's back. Right, yeah. And I got onto, and I, I burst out laughing when Owen Wilson's, because I was just like, this is such bad writing. Like, right, right. you've told me so many ways that there are no consequences. Why would you possibly imagine that I would care? And I hopped onto a Zoom call with people who were literally crying because they felt so broken about what happened to his character, to Mobius. And I, again, I don't, I think as a complete, I'm, gl- it's not fun to cry, but I mean, like, right, if right, a right. show affected you that much, I'm so happy for you. I'm not saying for a word you're wrong if that happened to you. But it very much didn't for me. And that's where I was, felt I was kind of like, this show isn't for me. And and that's okay. Like, I, I just had a conversation about the movie Dune where I was saying, like, you know, people were saying, like, they loved it because of this, like, it was such an artistic way of telling a story. And it was using visuals instead of dialogue to tell a story. And I was mm-hmm. like, I just thought it was a lot of really boring 10-second shots of the scenery instead of having people do anything. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's not for me. That There should right. be more visual styles of yeah, movie yeah. making. Yeah. And I'm glad they exist. People seem to love multiversal stories. I'm glad they exist. But I want characters to have agency. You know, and and that could, we, we kind of I, I think that point was just so clear to both of us that we kind of jumped past it. We don't need to say much more on it. But yeah. to me, I think one of, one of the reasons why it bothered me so much is because character growth matters so much to me. Mm-hmm. And so, a there's the like, did you act? Did this character like you know to go back to the thing? If Anakin has this glorious moment where he realizes he doesn't want to be Darth Vader anymore, he wants to be the father to Luke, he wants to overthrow the Emperor great if actually there's 99 percent of universes where darth vader doesn't do that but this one universe where he does and someone else has decided that that one universe is the only real one yeah, yeah, like yeah. then what did it matter you know right, right, right. and with loki we're kind of getting that double because the entire loki character in that show was erasing the character growth we've seen the character have for the last three movies yeah 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 and then the end of the show is like, right. oh, but Mo- Mobius has now lost all the character growth he had, you know? Like, yeah. It's, uh... yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the fact that the the Loki that we'd seen through Ragnarok um, right. was... And Infinity was, War. And like in, a very important scene in Infinity War. Well, I mean, through what? One scene of Infinity War? Well, but a um, very significant for its character scene, but yes. <laughs> yeah. Which was... Uh, I don't know. Um, he's a moron. But... <laughs> <laughs> That, that's my bigger gripe with an Infinity War. It's just like, I feel like, why why did y'all just give all the stones to Thanos? Like, what's wrong with you? But whatever. Yeah. Um, the, yeah, the, all the, and, and through Dark World, right? Like, all of that character growth is gone. So we're not seeing that character anymore. So they took the character up to a certain point, then they like rewound him, basically. And then they're like, Oh, but we showed him a video of that stuff, so it's he's kind of like the same Loki yeah. again. And it's like, mm, mm, no, don't mm. buy it. You know, and and it, yeah, exactly. Like the you know ninety nine percent of Darth Vader's <laughs> watch <laughs> watch the Emperor kill Luke, but one percent. <laughs> it's like so you're saying there's a chance. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you picture the Time Lords just going there, being like, all right, rewind it. All right, run it back. Right. Run it back. No, this is the t- no. All right, run it back. Run it back a yeah. little more. Here, move that stone. Okay, there, there you go. Let's, yeah. let's take that one. Because, yeah, because if the point is I'm supposed to go back and watch the prequels and think Anakin's falling to darkness, but I'm also seeing the goodness in him that will pull him back. And actually, it's just a weird fluke because, like you said, where a rock right, 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 was, right. and most of the time Anakin doesn't do that. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's a weird like, fluke, prob- and the rest of the time he's like, F Luke. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, anyway, I think that's about all of the... Um, that is all of the ways that I came up with to disguise my ranting and venting as actual serious ethical conversation. Uh, what about for you? Do you have any more rants that you want to disguise under the veneer of a uh, critique of storytelling or an ethical veneer? No, that's pretty much all I got. I mean, just to be clear, like I am very much critiquing the idea of the Marvel Cinematic Multiverse. I'm, I'm not critiquing people's enjoyment. Like, whatever. People like what they like. That's cool. Yeah. But like... I don't like it. <laughs> yeah. I, it. I, I, I think that's a perfect way of saying it. Yeah. Again, this is if people who love it, great. And certainly I, I, I think I think I can speak for both of us, but no, certainly for me, when those movies come out and a lot of people I know are talking about how great they are, mm-hmm. I'm not. And I, I want people who agree with us, like, please listen to this. Like, I'm not going to go and 
go to those people's posts and be like, oh, you're stupid because the multiverse right. doesn't make sense. Like, let people like the things they want to like. Yeah. But if you don't want to like it, come here and chat with us. Yeah, exactly. And like, because I, I, it's felt pretty lonely sometimes. Yeah, and yeah. like, I know when I've put up a little bit of a post that was like, yeah, it's not my favorite. I've gotten like 10 DMs of people being like, thank God someone else said it, you know? Oh, so wow. yeah. that's kind of just all, all we're trying to do here is like, yeah. it, it's the letting people know they're not alone for thinking it. But also I, I know a lot of good meaning people who love the multiverse stuff, but just want to understand why some folks didn't like it. So hopefully this is kind of a, a clarification for it. Um, well, Paul, in this universe, at least, I know that you have returned to the world of poker and content creation. Uh, where can people find that? Yeah, in 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 this universe, I am currently in Las Vegas, um, the the neon desert, uh, making most uh, making poker content on. Well, by the time this airs airs, I don't know is released <laughs> onto the web. Um, mm-hmm. I will be. Uh, making stuff on Twitch again, Zen Madman at Twitch, Zen Madman on Twitter, and uh, Zen Madman Poker on YouTube. Awesome. Um, I only need 953 more subscribers, and then I'll get cents and cents in ad Yay. money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely do, do check all that out. And of course, if you want to check out more of my stuff, you can find this podcast, as well as my Star Wars podcast, uh, on the ethicalpanda.com. There you'll also find information about the Marvel Movie Minute podcast. And the next couple of weeks, there's a lot of great content coming out that I'm going to be covering in a couple of different places. Hopefully, we're going to drag Paul around into some of that as much as we can. Uh, so if you're playing at Vegas uh, or in the Vegas online stuff, don't throw quite as much money to Paul, especially at – I'll tell you what particular times. If the tables run bad, he's more likely to come and podcast with that's, us. That's so, not true at all. It is I, the exact I, opposite. <laughs> the faster I make money playing poker and streaming, the more time I'll have for podcasting. Well, right, but if you're scheduled to do a podcast while the tables are their absolute best, like, you know, that might be a hard time to pull you away, so. <laughs> that's that's not a thing. <laughs> I think there's a universe where it is a thing, but probably Give not in most universes. more of your money. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> there you go. There you go. So, yeah, check out all those podcasts. Uh, check out what Paul's doing. Check out all the great things happening on Stranded Panda. And whether you love the multiverse, hate the multiverse, couldn't give a rat's ass as long as you get to see the, the heroes looking super pretty on screen. Any of those positions, have a nice day. Or would you be having a nice day and a not nice day at the same time in, in different uh, timelines? You know. How did we get through that whole podcast without mentioning Schrodinger? <laughs> uh, Schrodinger's podcast? It was both recorded and not recorded? No! Wait, was I supposed to hit record? <laughs> Goodbye, everybody. <laughs>